You guys ready for the word? I believe that you are. And so, uh, thank you. You can just set that right there. You, you. Set over here a little bit. That work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's give them a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right. All righty. Well, for the last nine weeks, <laughs> we've been talking about what? So great salvation. All right. So uh, our background text for this has come from uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So maybe you're tuning in for the first time today. But this is a scripture where we have come from. And, you know, we have kind of gone through a progression here as we have been teaching and talking about. And the Lord has been laying out certain things pertaining to our great salvation. So in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, the writer there, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us and he, he pleads with us and warns us to not neglect this so great salvation that God has given us. And we have discussed and we have researched and looked at the word salvation there, which comes from the Greek word sozo, which covers everything pertaining to our lives, not just our ticket into heaven, but God has stamped everything pertaining to life and godliness concerning us. Jesus has finished the work on the cross, and now you and I have the authority, have the ability, and have the responsibility to uh, carry out that finished work here in the earth. And so uh, we do that in our lives as God has touched all of our lives, and we accepted Jesus into our lives uh, once upon a time, and we have been living for him ever since then. And so this great salvation is not just about when we get to heaven, you know, those things are what we look forward to. But in addition to that, God has given us so many things that he wants us to do here on the earth as sons, as daughters of the Most High God. And as we read in, in Romans chapter 8, it, it talks about how all of creation is groaning and travailing and waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And this is you and I, and this is our lives on the earth right now. And so we are to exercise that kingdom dominion, that kingdom authority, based on the Father, the greater one that is on the inside of us that's doing the works. Amen? And so today, you know, last week we kind of got into, uh, the Lord began to direct me in the area of repentance, and we talked about some aspects of that and, and, and in our relationships with other people. Um, and the two greatest commandments that Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second commandment uh, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, upon these two things, these two commandments hinge all of the law and the prophets. And so we looked at the Ten Commandments. The first four were directed towards our relationship and our dealings with God. And, this, and the last six deal with our relationship with other people. And the thing is, if you honor the first four, guess what? It's going to be very easy and doable to do the last six. Okay? And not in reverse order. Okay? And so today we're going to continue in some things as, you know, the first parts of this series, we've been dealing with the things that pertain to our rights and our covenant privileges and all of those things and, and our authority and so forth that we should exercise here on the earth. But last week and this week, God has been, inter you know, internalizing some things and dealing with some underlying things that go on in our lives and that we need to deal with. Some things that are below the surface, um, such as our heart attitudes and things of that nature. And so today we're continuing with some things, but we're going to be talking about the Lordship of Jesus. Okay? So today, even though we're still talking about this great salvation, we're going to be talking about the Lordship of Jesus. And so I'm going to ask everyone to turn over to Romans chapter 10. And this is really where all of us begin that have accepted Jesus. This is where we, the, one of the scriptures that is a basis for our confession or profession of faith unto salvation. And so we're going to start here and look at some things here. So Romans chapter 10, for those of you that have yet to be born again, yet to accept Jesus, um, this is also for you. 
So if you have accepted Jesus, this is also for you, okay? Because there are some things that we're going to discuss in this. And, you know, sometimes we can read things. How many of you have ever written something? And, um, and then you ask someone else to read it, to kind of proof it. And then they will point out things that you, you, have, you may have read it over and over again. And then somebody else can come along and read it. And they'll point out something, whether it's a grammatical error or whether it's, you know, something that maybe wasn't quite as clear as what you were trying to express it. But you didn't see it up until that time. But it took someone pointing it out for you to see certain things, you know. And it's like this with the Word of God. You know, sometimes we can be on autopilot because we read something over and over again. And sometimes we can miss something because we've read it so much. But this is why, you know, it's good to read, um, you know, not just, you know, one version as far as like the King James, but read the Amplified, read other legitimate versions or, you know, translations of the Bible that are good, because there are some that aren't good, but read the ones that are good that you can also, because they, like the Amplified, for example, it, it, it really opens up understanding and meaning of certain things, okay? It amplifies it, okay? I wouldn't say that it shouts it, but it does, you know, amplify it, you know? And so it's good to read other versions like that to help you to see things that you didn't maybe not see before. You understand what I'm saying? And so Romans 10, 9, it says this, and I'm going to read this from a couple of different uh, versions today just to uh, provide further clarity. And so it says here, out of the King James, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Let's stop right there. Notice he says here, and I want to point out this. He did not say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Savior, Jesus. Let me just let that one marinate a little bit. He said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord, Jesus. So in other words, I am confessing, I am acknowledging First, what has taken place in my heart, that I have acknowledged Jesus as Lord, okay? He didn't say Savior. He said, I'm acknowledging Jesus as Lord. This is why so many people confess Jesus, but there's, yeah, there's no change, okay? We must confess him as Lord, and there is a big difference in just confessing him as Savior. How many of you have come across people and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I confessed Jesus back when I was a child. What a blah, 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 so on. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And maybe there was, you know, genuine uh, conversion that took place in. So I'm not refuting that. That may have been. But the thing is this. We must acknowledge the lordship of Jesus. And there is a crucial difference. A very important difference in understanding that he's not just Savior. He's not just the one that bailed me out. Okay? But when I acknowledge him, according to Romans 10, 9, I'm acknowledging him as Lord, which means I'm acknowledging him, another word for Lord is master. I'm acknowledging him as owner. Who does he own? Me now. <laughs> okay? I'm acknowledging him as the possessor. Okay, he possess, possesses me now because he purchased me with his blood. I'm acknowledging him as ruler over all that pertains to my life, everything that pertains to me now. So there is a big difference in acknowledging him as Lord than just saying, Jesus, I believe on you and that you died and so on. Do you see what I'm talking about? Now you can see the difference that takes place in some people in the church and why some people continue to exhibit certain behaviors and why others, you know, you see the fruits unto repentance. So there is a big difference. And he said here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus or acknowledging that he is Lord. See, acknowledging him as Lord, guess what? It's going to be, it's going to come. Savior is going to cover, be covered in it. Everything else that is under his lordship is now going to apply to my life. And that's, this is why you have so many people 
Uh, I mean, I've heard of this, uh, other preachers, and they talked about how so, how so many people, you know, prayed the prayer of salvation at, you know, evangelists prayed it at, you know, different meetings. Even it was said by Billy Graham, who's passed on off the scene. It, one of the things that he regretted, one of the things that he regretted is that out of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that he evangelized, that prayed the prayers, he said there was not true discipleship that took place out of the majority of them. And this was because there were so many people that got convicted at the moment and they prayed the prayer, but they acknowledged that, you know, I need, you know, I need to escape God's wrath and hell and so on, but they did not profess Jesus as Lord. So as I, when I profess him as Lord, it means that he now is my master, his ruler, and so it's, it's, you know, I don't like to use this term, you know, as slave, but he becomes our owner, okay? He becomes our master, all right? So I'm not trying to use that in a negative sense, but you understand the terminology that now I belong to him. And this, you know, some people say, well, I, you know, this is where some, this is why there's conflict and this is why we see certain things going on because we have not understood what it means to confess Jesus as Lord, okay? So he says here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus or that Jesus is Lord, now he's my Lord. This is what you're saying. When you confess this, you are personalizing this and you're saying that now, Jesus, I acknowledge you as my master, as my ruler. So now, what is it that you want me to do? How is it that you want me to live? What is it that you want me to think like? How should my speech be now? You're my master. It's not me now. I, I live by you now. This is lordship. You guys follow me? And so he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confessing lordship, not saviorship, gets a person saved. Okay? Big difference. Then he says here, verse 10, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed. And let, let me read this out of, um, let's see, let's read it out of the Amplified. It says, verse 9, because if you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart believe, adhere to, trust in, and rely on the truth, that God raised him from the dead, not like any other person. No other religious leader can claim that. That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the two parts to this, acknowledging his lordship and believing that God raised him from the dead. And it says, for with the heart of a person believes, or for with the heart a person believes, adheres to, trusts in, relies on Christ, and so is justified, declared righteous and acceptable to God, and with the mouth he confesses, declares openly, and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. And then it says, the scripture says, no man believes in him, or no man who believes in him, who adheres to, relies on, and trusts in him, will ever be put to shame or disappointed. Okay, now I'm going to read this out of the uh, complete Jewish Bible. It says it this way. It says that if you acknowledge publicly with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord, not Savior, is Lord, and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be delivered. 
okay? So as we talked about that word salvation, sozo, remember we said it, it doesn't just mean your ticket to heaven. It means deliverance from temporal evils, from everything that will try to snuff your life out. That means spiritually, that means physically, that means emotionally, that means soulishly, that means financially, that covers everything, okay? And it says, for with the heart one goes on trusting, and listen to this, and thus continues towards righteousness, while the mouth, with the mouth, one keeps on. So it's not just, I, it's a one and done. It's an every day, it says, keeps on making public acknowledgement and thus continues towards deliverance. So every day, I'm acknowledging and I'm speaking out the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Why? Because when I got born again, that was just the beginning. And, and through the process, um, you know, guess what? We don't become any more righteous than the day that we got born again. But as we have talked about, there is a process of sanctification that takes place. And this is why we must continue to acknowledge and confess the lordship of Jesus because there are areas in our lives that have to continuously be brought under his lordship. There are areas where God begins to show us things that we didn't see or know at first, but he shows us as we grow, as we hear the word, there are things that he reveals to us in our lives that we have to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so this is what salvation is. It's, it's, it's acknowledging the lordship of Jesus and continuously submitting ourselves to that lordship. So there are things that we see that God shows us that we hear by the preaching of the word, that we see when we read the word, and we didn't see it before when we read it, but now that we have grown and God has shown us and he's dealt with us in other areas, he says, now let me show you this. Let's deal with this so that you can get that out of your life. So let's deal with this so you can move forward in some other areas in your life where you've been, you know, the enemy's been having a string in your life to pull you and tug at you at some times. So the lordship of Jesus is what we must continuously acknowledge in our lives in all areas, all areas. It, when we read over in Philippians chapter two, and the Lord said this to me this morning, he said, every knee that bows in Philippians chapter two did not do so because they wanted to. Some, you know, there were some knees that were just like, Lord, you are Lord. And, you know, and willingly bow. But there are some knees that, you know, they weren't so willing to bow. But the Bible still says that every knee must bow, every tongue must confess that Jesus is not Savior, but he is Lord. He is ruler. He is master. He is conqueror. He is the head of all. You understand? So, Let's turn over to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and we're going to begin at verse 46. You guys there? Are you there? I'll wait for you. You're worth waiting on. All right. In Luke chapter 6, verse, um, excuse me. <laughs> All right, let's start in verse uh, 46. And he says this, and this is Jesus speaking here. And he says, why call ye me Lord, Lord, or master, ruler, and do not do the things which I say? So, just to give you a little backdrop here, now, Jesus had 12 disciples that he mentored. It was basically like an apprenticeship. So he called them, asked them, to, you know, told them to follow him and so on. And during it, that three to three and a half years, he taught them, he instructed them, and then he had them demonstrate, okay? And, and this was their discipleship, and this is how all of us should be discipled, you know? We're instructed, 
but not just so that we can be puffed up with knowledge, but also he sent them out to do what he instructed them to do, okay? He taught them how to do the things that, that they did so that when he would move on, guess what? They would know how to carry on just as he did. And so this is why oftentimes they, they knew that they had been with the Lord, you know, the religious leaders and other people because of the speech that they had, because of the demonstration of the power of God that they displayed, it was because of the things that they had learned, okay, while they were with Jesus. Jesus is telling them as their rabbi, as their master, their teacher, he's saying, don't call me master unless you're going to do what I say to do. So in other words, he was really challenging them because they had their own paradigms about how to do certain things. And he was telling them, okay, I know what you know and where you are and, and all of that, but listen to what I'm saying. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? If you want to see this, do what I'm telling you to do, okay? And this is how, what we see in the word of God. He says, if you call me Lord, do what I'm instructing you to do because I already know what's going on in your life. I already know the problems that you're dealing with. I already understand. So listen to what I'm trying to tell you to help you. Let me be Lord in your life so that the things that are in your life can now be brought under my lordship so that that situation can now be turned around in your life do you hear what i'm saying to you see i know that you you've been rubbing two pennies together but let me tell you about how to get out of that and it's going to challenge your thinking because you've been used to holding on that's what you've been taught but now i'm telling you to give so that i can now open up the windows of heaven see i can't tell men to give unto you until you give. Do you understand? Amen. So let me be Lord in your life. If you want me to be Lord and you call me Lord, then listen to the instructions. As I, as I heard it said, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Okay, all right. So this is what he's saying here. Don't call me Lord if you're not gonna do what I'm saying to do. If you call me Lord, trust me to be Lord. Trust what I say is so. This is what he's saying here, okay? So he says, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He says, whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and doeth and, and do them, <laughs> does them, I had, I had regular English and Elizabethan English converting all at the same time just now, <laughs> all right? Do's them. All right. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will show you to him to whom he is like. <laughs> and he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and doeth not is like a man with, that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. All right, so we see here a couple of things that are going on here, obviously. We see one man's house that was built on the rock, and we all know that the rock is the sayings of the word of God, the sayings of Jesus, and the things that God tells us. That is the rock that our houses, our lives should be built on. And then we see the example of the foolish man's house that, um, as it says in Matthew chapter 7, the other um, witness of this account, um, in this particular account, he's talking about the foolish man who built his house on the earth, or as it says in Matthew 7, on the sand. And the same winds came, and the same winds blew, and the storm came and beat up on the house, and it fell in the house. The, great, the, the fall of that house was great. So we see here two different scenarios. And what I have learned is that this applies to us personally. It applies to us personally, individually, 
You know, when you hear the sayings of God, or when Jesus instructs us of something, when we see something in the Word of God, or you're sitting in a setting like this, and, and the preacher tells you something from the Word of God, and you hear the Word of God, okay? And, and the Lord told me this. He said, the hearing that was heard was not just instructions from the Word, but sometimes it was warnings, okay? So the things that came forward were, again, they, God speaks to us individually, he always speaks to us individually, and we have examples of the Word of God. You know, God is very, very merciful, okay? Look at somebody around you and say, God is very merciful, okay? But sometimes we confuse the mercy of God with his approval on something, okay? Because God is long-suffering, and he's merciful, and, you know, and judgment doesn't always happen instantly, you know? And so sometimes people can get the mercy of God confused with that God approves of something because nothing has happened, okay? And so you have to understand that there are two sides of God. <laughs> there is a merciful side of God, and God is very long-suffering. But then there's also the judgment and the wrath side of God. And that's the side that we try not to get towards. You understand what I'm saying here? <laughs> that's the side that we don't want to go towards. But God is, there are two sides, you know, and sometimes people have gotten confused uh, in these days and thinking that because, um, you know, Jesus has done everything and so we, you know, the grace of God permits us to do whatever. And that's a big lie. It's a big deception, okay? And so Jesus said, why call me Lord if you're not going to do what I said to do? And he says, the one who personally receives instruction or warning or, or correction from the word and does it, his house is built on a rock. But the one who does not, who hears the word, said, ah, yeah, whatever. That person is building a house. Okay, they're building a house. But they're building it on a foundation that is going to cause it to crumble. And so, personally, God speaks to us in these things. Then we see also, corporately, God speaks to us in these manners. As far as governmentally, God speaks to us in these manners. Leadership, God speaks to us in these manners. Okay? And so, all of these different areas, the areas where God is established as pillars in society, okay? God speaks to us. He speaks to those persons that are in these positions. He speaks to us all on the same basis of his lordship from his word. And so I, want, I have an example here, and, and this is what I'm sharing to you. So you know, the, God is very, very merciful, and God gives us so many chances to change. So many. Think about your life personally. Think about how merciful God has been to you. You know that you did something, and, it, you know, if it was not for the mercy of God, you know, you could have been snuffed out. Somebody was praying for you. Somebody was covering you when you... <laughs> God's mercy kept you. And God is very long-suffering. And we see that all throughout the Bible. But there is coming a time because there is a coming move of the Spirit of God. And so... As God is preparing for this time, he's preparing us for this time. And he is doing some things that are cleaning up and, and preparing us for a great move of the Spirit of God. There is something that is coming, that is on the horizon, that is coming by way of the Spirit of God. And God is doing some things right now to get things in order. And so I want you to turn over to, let's look at an example where you're going to see what I'm talking about, and you're going to be like, wow, okay? 
<laughs> yeah, do like that. Wow. Okay. Let's turn over to uh, Genesis chapter 15. You know, the Lord showed me this this morning. I was like, whoo-wee. I'm a tither, right? <laughs> right, Elder Henson? <laughs> whoo-wee. All right, well, let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Now, while you are there, I'm going to show you something here that will kind of help to uh, paint a picture, give you a visualization. All right. So um, I have up here, I have this bowl just so that I won't make a mess of things up here. Um, so I hope you guys can see it enough, even though this bowl is concealing some of this. But as we talk about the mercy of God and how, you know, God deals with things, you know, sometimes the flood that comes is natural circumstances and situations that we deal with and, you know, things that go on. Sometimes the things that we call the storms and the floods is also God dealing with certain things, all right? So, as I mentioned, you know, it, it, there are two sides of God, and he's very, that's the last draw. The last straw, as they say, that's the last straw that God wants to get to in, in dealing with things. And so, think about this. We even have this in Matthew chapter 18. We see an example that God gives us and how we deal with people. He says, if a brother sins against you, first go to that brother privately. He says, go to him privately and say, you know, you, you wronged me. You did this. Talk to them privately. He, said, he didn't say go blast them and publicly and do all this and put all their business out on the street. You know, girlfriend, did you, let me tell you something. No. God says, go to the person individually. First, privately. Okay? Privately. Not on Facebook. Okay? All right? Not, you know, he said, privately go to them. Then if they don't hear you, then he says, take a witness. Then he said, if you don't hear after that, the person doesn't hear after that, then put, a, put it before the congregation. And then he says, if they don't receive it, then treat them like a pagan or like a tax collector. You know how we like the tax collectors. <laughs> All right? All right? And so he says, you know, there are, there are even measures to, you know, be merciful to give people a chance to get things right. And God deals with us very mercifully. If he dealt with us and the first time that we did something, guess what, man? <laughs> you know, there wouldn't be a chair that was filled in this place today. I wouldn't be standing here before you today. You understand? And so God is very merciful. But this is what happens, okay? This represents the iniquity, okay? The lawlessness that one may continue to practice all right, and this is the cup that gets filled each time that we could continue to practice lawlessness, okay? So we do something, guess what? A little bit goes into it. We think, oh, nothing happened. It's all good, so guess what? A little bit more. Continue. Hey, yeah, it's starting to feel good now. All the while, the devil's setting you up. You thought that because you didn't tithe, that guess what, because the, you know, the, the enemy made sure that you, know, you had a certain increase in your life. You say, well, that's it. I'm doing, I'm doing fine now. You know, I was doing better when I don't tithe than when I did. <laughs> a little bit more. Or, or you slip around and you sneak around, you do something you shouldn't be doing. Got away with it. Nothing happened, continues, continue in this cycle, and guess what? After a while, that cup begins to overflow. All the while, God sent people across your path to say, hey, well, first of all, God dealt with you individually. We have what's called a conscious. God speaks to us first. Before God has to bring a person to us, he speaks to us first. Okay? We may not have heard it or acknowledged it, or wanted to obey it, but he spoke to us first. And now God has to use a preacher or he has to use another person around us. Then he may have to use a circumstance in our lives, okay? But God, the last thing that God wants to do is to pour out his wrath and his judgment 
on you for the thing that you have done. And God is very merciful. And it, and it takes, sometimes it takes a while before it gets to this point where it just, the iniquity is full, as the Bible says, where it overflows. But God, and this could be in any area of your life, any area. It could be pertaining to your finances. It could be pertaining to uh, uh, immorality. It could be pertaining to, you know, uh, uh, you know just your, your attitude and your words that come out of your mouth. It could be pertaining to, the, you know, just the way that you view things and the way that you talk about things, the way that you treat others. It could be a lot of different things that this applies to. So it's not just one thing. But when you continue in it, what you're doing is you're filling the cup up more and more because, you know, you're not repenting and not changing and so on. All right, so let's look at something here in Genesis chapter 15. Um, we're going to start reading in verse 13. And it says this here, and God is talking to uh, Abram before he was changed to Abraham, and he's cutting this covenant with him. And it says in verse 13, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. He's talking about Egypt. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great substance. So, you know, God is sharing with Abraham here, uh, you know, a prophetic, some prophetic things that are going to take place here. Then it says in verse uh, 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. And then look at what it says in verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, if you back up one chapter prior to this, we see here that Abraham was, he and the Amorites were allies with each other. Um, they warned him that, you know, Lot had been taken and so on. And this is when uh, Abraham uh, gathered up 300 plus of his servants and they went out and they, you know, got them back and so on. But it says in verse uh, 13 of chapter 14 that the Amorites were allies with Abraham. But yet God is telling him in chapter 15, right here in verse 16, that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. So we see here as he's talking, God is telling Abraham in the fourth generation, so this was after Abraham would have passed on off the scene, the children of Israel have been in Egypt and they come out of Egypt and he's telling them that now they're gonna go into the land of Canaan and when they come into this land, because this is where Abraham was when he was cutting this covenant, he says, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. They're going to come back here again. And he says, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So in other words, there's coming a time when there is going to be such corruption and lawlessness in the land that, as the Bible says, it's going to spew them out or vomit them out. And it's at that time when the children of Israel are going to come back into the land and they're going to possess the land. So there is, from that day when Abraham, who had been with allies with the Amorites up until that time of that fourth generation, there was iniquity that had been built time after time, generation after generation up until that point. And so I want you guys to read this this week, read, because we're not going to go through all of it, but read Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20. And we're going to look at some things in this, and you're going to see our nation in the things that we will cover or that you will read in this. And you'll see what God says about it, and you'll see also what he says what happened. So let's turn over. We're going to read a part of it because God does not change as far as his viewpoint on sin, okay, lawlessness. And this is what you have to understand. So he's very merciful, as we talked about. He's very merciful. But don't confuse that with him 
being okay with it, okay? So Leviticus chapter 18. Now the Lord is speaking unto Moses and he's telling Moses, he's, warn, he's telling Moses so that he can warn the children of Israel. All right? We're now in, going into that, that generation that God had told Abraham about. And he's warning them, when you get into this land, you, you need to look out for these things. He says in verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord. Okay, there's that word Lord there. I am the Lord, your God. See, he's personalizing. See, we profess Jesus as our Lord. Okay, you can't say, you know, just he's the Lord of the congregation of, of people in here, so that makes him my Lord. No, I have to personalize it and make him my Lord. And so God is talking to, the, to them collectively and individually. He's saying, I am the Lord, your God. And he says, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwell, you shall not do. So he's saying, the things that you saw them do in the land of Egypt, don't participate in those things. He warned them, <laughs> and they still did. <laughs> and then he says, and after the doings of the land of Canaan, this is what God was telling Abraham about previously. Whether I bring you, um, you shall not do. So he's talking about the land where they were about to go into. They just left the land of Egypt. He says, you saw stuff there going on. You were there for 400 years. Okay, you saw a lot of stuff going on. He says, don't do that stuff. Okay, have no participation in it. Then he says, now I'm taking you to another land. And you're going to see some things there. You're going to see some idolatrous stuff there. You're going to see some immoral stuff there. But he says, do not participate in it. And he says, I'm going to bring the land that I bring you to, you shall not do, neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall do my judgments and keep my, my ordinances to walk therein. For I am the Lord your God. Okay? That's not your Lord. Those things that they're serving is not your Lord. I am the Lord your God. And then he says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And then he says again, he reiterates this four times just in these five verses I am the Lord. So he's talking about the acknowledgement. Okay, not just a confession, but the acknowledgement through how I live that the Lord is my Lord. And when you read throughout chapter 18, chapter 20, you, he lists all kinds of things here because there were, these were the things that they were doing in the land that they were about to go into. And he, was, he laid them out and he listed them and he says, don't do these things. You're going to see them. But I'm telling you, don't participate in them. And then he, he goes on in verse uh, 22, and he says, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 25, he says, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity. Remember he talked about the iniquity of the Amorites being full? This was that time. He says, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. So, this is what God was telling them about. He told Abraham about the iniquity now at this point was full and they were going into the land. So let's look. I, I have in my notes, so we're not, you can read chapters 18 and 20, but I have in my notes, uh, you know, a summary of the things that God listed out in these verses. So some of the things I will say directly and some of them I'm going to ask you to read because we do have younger ears in here. But um, but these were some of the iniquities of the Amorites. Um, one, there was uncovering of the nakedness of mom. 
dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, etc. <laughs> so there were things, there were practices that were going on, and you guys understand what I mean by uncovering the nakedness, okay? There were things that were going on that he said, you're going to see these things in the land. But he says, do not participate in those things. So when you look at all of these things that are listed here, you're going to see what's going on in our nation. And you're going to see why what is going on now is going on. Okay? It says, next one is, Offering children to the god Moloch. He warned them about this. This was a form of abortion. This was sacrificing their seed unto this pagan god Moloch. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this, okay? And I want you guys to understand this. A part of Jesus being Lord in our lives means that I have to also vote God, not culture, not race, not what's accepted socially necessarily at the time. You guys understand me? I hope you guys hear me because I'm telling you something that this the stuff that was here is what caused a curse to be in the practices and, and all of the false prophets of Baal. This is what they did. And this is what is going on in our society today. This is what is going on in our country. And the thing is this, that when we support that, okay, even though you say, no, I would never, you know, do abortion myself personally, okay, but some of you think it is okay. Okay, and it's wrong. According to the scriptures, not my opinion, it's wrong. So, when we participate in such things, it's just like when, as they say, you, you know, when even though you may not have been the one that was pulling the trigger, but if you help the person that pulled the trigger, it's just like you pulled the trigger. You understand? And so, this is one of those things. And he said, you're going to see this going on in the land, but have no participation in this. He says, not lying with a male as with a woman. In fact, he said, he said it's an abomination. So again, because I know that there are many people who confess or profess that they are Christians, and they think, they say that it's okay. There are pastors that preach that this is okay from the pulpit. So again, you know, this is, you know, this is not hate speech. <laughs> this is, I love you, and I'm telling you, God loves you, and you need to, you know, people always talk about being woke. You need to wake up, and you need to understand what God says about it, so that if Jesus is your Lord, he wants you to understand that he did not design you as a male to sleep with a male or as a female to sleep with a female. There, I've said it. <laughs> All right. And so God loves you so much. And this is why he wants you to know that. Because there are so many people that are on their way to hell and they think that they're on their way somewhere else. He said, it's an abomination. This is what he said. So read Leviticus chapter 18. Read Leviticus chapter 20. I didn't say it. I'm just the spokesperson. 
Okay? He said, it's an abomination to do such. And this is what we see. He said, you're going to go into the land. You're going to see this. I know you may have friends that do this. There's some, I, I've met some, and there's some of the nicest people. Sometimes more genuine than some people that are Christians. <laughs> but I'm telling you, God is against that. He loves them. He loves you, but he's against that sin. That's what it is. It's, um, it's, it's an iniquity. It's an abomination. That's what it is. Okay? Not my opinion, but my opinion now. This is what you got to understand. If Jesus is my Lord, guess what? My opinion must be what his is. And that's it. That is it. There's nothing else besides deception. Okay? That's it. Other than what he says, there's only deception. There's only lie. That is it. So he says, um, let's see. He says the same thing, beastology. I won't get into that. You guys can read that. Look at this. He says, he talks about not turning to mediums and familiar spirits, witchcraft, wizardry. He talks about all of that. Look at the abundance of witchcraft that comes through our TV now. Look at the abundance. Disney Channel. Look at the abundance of witchcraft that is, that is indoctrinating our children. See, this is what he's after. If he can't kill them and offer them to Moloch, he, he wants to indoctrinate them with other stuff. And so he says, you're going to see these things in the land, but don't participate in them. Don't just give your child a tablet and let them just watch whatever just because now they're not bothering you. He says, you're going to see witchcraft. You're going to see wizardry. You're going to see all of this stuff in the land. And this is, look at our nation around us. It's full of it. It's full of it. But God wants to fill his land with something else. And this is what I'm saying. He says, um, cursing father or mother. He talks about that. Committing adultery with your neighbor's wife. Lies with his father's wife. Lies with his daughter-in-law. Man lies with man. Marry, one, marry mom and daughter. Lies with sister. Lies with woman when she has flow of blood. Okay? Taking his brother's wife. Okay? All of these things. We see all of this stuff. Man, I'm telling you. And this is the good old United States of America. Right here. And this is, you know, so, you know, the Bible talks about this, and we see this, that history oftentimes repeats itself. God's patterns don't change, and he deals with us, but he's very merciful. And God has, has extended his mercy towards us individually and as a nation for a very long time. And so some of the things that we see that's going on, there, there is a, a shaking, there is things that, are, that is going on that God is dealing with, and he is establishing divine order, okay? And, and what we're going to see, and as the Bible talks about, judgment first begins in the house of God. And why is that? Because we are the doorkeepers. We are the gatekeepers, and the reason that a lot of these things that we see going on in our nation is because we have allowed them through the church, okay? And, and they have been allowed in other positions of authority in our, in our society that God has established as pillars of authority. And this is why we see those things, you know, prevalent going on. And so all of these things that were listed here, and I pray that you guys read them this week. You know, and it's, you know, somebody's saying, well, that was the Old Testament, you know, it's Bible, okay? It's God's law that does not change. He's merciful. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to do away with it. You understand? He's given us, you know, by what he conquered, because we could not, you know, necessarily do all of the things that God says, you do this and so on. You know, we were, 
Jesus came and he did what we could not do, so now we can do what he has done through his cross. All right, this is what the grace of God does for us. It gives us the ability now to identify the areas where we were in sin or in lawlessness, and now we can repent and we can turn to God and we can live righteously and holy before him, okay? And so we see all of these things here, and, uh, you know, whether you're an individual out there and you've been participating in these things or whether you look around us and you see these things going on in our nation, but God is establishing, you know, his order because he is doing some things. He's preparing us for some things. And, and God has to wreck some things to get some things straight so that he can move on the scene and do the things that he wants. He has to get the chaos and the disorder that has been in place, you know, so that he can establish. And, you know, and, and, and there are still going to be things that are going to go on until Jesus comes back. But in the church... In the church, there is a window that God is opening. There is a window that he's open for us to do some things that we have never done before across the world. And so I'm going to end something on Galatians chapter 2, and I'm going to ask you to turn there. And I want you to remember this scripture. Go back and read Leviticus 18 and 20 throughout this week. I want you to remember this as sons and daughters of the Most High God now. And some of you saying, well, I just don't think that God wants me to, to be like that, or I think that this is okay. Well, you can think whatever it is that you want to think. But God loves you, and he wants you to understand what is right in his sight And how the enemy has deceived people through other means. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. That's it. So you understand that? So when we talk about I'm crucified with Christ, guess what? I don't have any more opinion of what his is. What do you think about it? Well, let's see what the word says about it. What do, you, what do you think about, uh, you know, what, let's, let's see what the word says about it. That's, that's what I have to think about it. Do you understand? So, uh, so he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But get this understanding, yet not I, even though I'm living, it's Christ that lives in me and through me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And the uh, Amplified, it says it this way. It says, For I have been crucified with Christ in him. I have shared his crucifixion. So I take up my cross, or as it says, execution, execution stake in one translation. I take up my cross. I've been crucified with him. Just when Jesus was crucified, I was crucified as well. So guess what? What my opinion is is what his opinion is. What my take on it is is what his take on it. What he says, that's what I say. What he does, hey, that's what I do. That's it. That's it. I've been crucified with Christ. In him, I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer I who expresses my opinion on the matter. <laughs> it is no longer I, okay, but it is Christ, the Messiah, who lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith. Or I live it to glorify God here in the earth as I am representative of him in the earth. I am, as an individual and as a body of Christ collectively, we are the seat of authority here in the earth. So I represent heaven. I don't come to the earth with my own ideologies and what I think. I come representing what heaven's government has told me to bring before you. So I live by faith 
in, in or by adherence to and reliance on and complete trust in the Son of God. If you call me Lord, trust what I say. Amen. Do what I say to do. Do what you see me do. I live in, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm going to stop right there. Enough said. <laughs> so, this week, check it out, peep it out, get woke <laughs> as to what God is saying to you and to me in these days because God is doing some wonderful things. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, I know that as we are approaching God's season, I know that God is dealing with some things right now. I know that as we approach Rosh Hashanah, as we approach Yom Kippur and Tabernacles, I know that God is dealing with some things. So I hope that you guys recognize and, and that you see some things that will take place uh, after that. You see some things that will take place after that. As God always deals with, um, you know, some things after those days. So some, some disturbing things will take place for some people. But there will be some good things that will take place for those who trust God, who serve God, and who know God. As the Bible says, they that know their God, not your God, but their God, personalized, they shall be strong and do exploits, as it says in the King James. They shall be strong and do. Amen? Amen. Well, let's stand to your feet. So this week, um, read Leviticus 18 and 20. Um, review what we just read in Galatians 2.20 and then add to this also Romans chapter 1 verses 26 through 32 Romans chapter 1 verses 26 through 32 so this is a uh, New Testament reference of some of the things that I um, that Leviticus 18 and 20 talk about somebody says well that's the Old Testament blah 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 you know how some people are with that. So read Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 32 as well. Know what the Lord says. Amen. Well, let's go before our Father. Father, we bless you today. And we thank you for the things that you have spoken to us. We love you, Father, and we know that you love your, your word says that you love the world. You knew all of this sin and iniquity that was in the world. And so we know that you love every person. There's not a person on this earth that Jesus did not come and die for. And so we thank you for that love that you've expressed toward us, Father. That love, Father, that tells us the truth so that we can experience the best of the best life that you have for us, the Zoe life, the everlasting, eternal life of God. And so you're the same one that all of us must stand before, the same Lord that we all must stand before one day. And so we thank you, Father, that on this side of life, you help us to understand the importance of your Lordship in our lives. To know that if you tell us something, that even if we don't understand it or agree with it at first, Father, that you're telling us something because you have our best interests at heart. Because you love us and you want us to be free. You want us to come out of the things that you see and that you know. Keep us in bondage. So we bless you today, Father. As some have heard some things today that maybe they weren't as prepared to hear today or that was an eye opener to them today I thank you Father that you deal with the, the hearts of all of us by your Holy Spirit 
For as your word says, when your spirit comes, you will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. So I thank you, Father, that your spirit is going in right now. And you're speaking to those that are in those lifestyles, Father, that you're against. You're speaking to those, Father, that have areas in their lives where they're not submitted to your lordship. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, that you're loving on them. You're loving on us. And you're letting them know, Father, that you're not there to condemn them, but to liberate them, to set them free. For your truth sets us free. And so we bless you today. And we give you all the glory. It belongs to you, O oh God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're out there today and you have never accepted Jesus as not just as Savior, but as Lord, we want to extend the invitation to you right now that on this day, September the 6th, 2020, you can become a part of God's eternal family. So as we read earlier in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth or acknowledge with your mouth the lordship of Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. For with your heart you believe unto righteousness, but with your mouth you speak out what you have believed in your heart. And so I want to pray a prayer with you right now. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask you to repeat these words after me. And say these words after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. You said in your word that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, that I will be saved. So I confess Jesus as my Lord, that he is my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised from the dead. So I thank you, Father, for salvation that is coming to my life and that Jesus is now Lord over my life. And I bless you in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, I first of all say to you, welcome to the family of God. I declare that your sins have been remitted right now, washed away by the blood of Jesus. Everything that you have done up to that point, God has washed away by that blood. So I encourage you to get plugged into a local church right now. Get plugged into this house. If you're in the Fredericksburg area, you need to be here. Because I'm telling you that there's a power of God, there's a truth of God, there's a presence of God that abides here. And God wants to continue to show you that he is Lord in every area of your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to love on you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to protect you in these days that you and I live in. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, we want to pray with you right now. Now I ask you to just extend your hands towards the screen of where you are. And so the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. So this is God's Spirit coming on us and filling us not just changing our spirits from death to life, where we became a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's what you just prayed when you accepted Jesus. But God's spirit also fills you now, where the Bible says that you will become witnesses of Jesus wherever you go. The question was once asked, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they answered and said, we have not even heard that there so much be a Holy Ghost. <laughs> so there is receiving salvation 
Then there's receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to fill you. You need God's power in these days. Because there are all kinds of things out there that come against us. But there's a greater one on the inside that is able to with, withstand and overcome anything that comes against us. And as Apostle Rock said earlier, you look at your circumstance from above and not below it. So I want you to extend your hands if that's you. I want you to extend your hands towards us right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, as there are some that are out there who are desiring to be filled with your spirit, right now we ask you to fill them with your Holy Spirit to overflow right now in the name of Jesus. They're right now where they are in their, in their home, in their car, as their hand is lifted up and extended, you're filling them right now with your power and with your spirit. You're baptizing them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So just breathe them in right now and then speak out the utterances, the things that are coming. And it's, it, it, it sounds different to you right now and it's welling up on the inside of you from your belly, but allow him to speak out of your mouth. The Holy Spirit is filling you right now. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance, as he gave the, the, the words. You're going to speak in another language. So it's not just gibberish. It's something that God is speaking. The Bible says we speak in the tongue of men and of angels. So I know it's different, but God is speaking through you right now. So allow him to do so right now. He's filling you right now where you are. If you have something that's going on in your body right now, just put your hand on the place of, of where the ailment is. Even if it's on your mind, there's some of you that are being oppressed in your minds right now. You've been succumbing to fear. You've been uh, succumbing, and it's caused all kinds of oppressive thoughts in your mind. You've been overcome with anxiety and stressing out about it. Well, right now, in the name of Jesus, I break the authority and the power of that spirit of of, of anxiety and fear in your life right now in Jesus name we take authority over it and tell you to go in Jesus name you have no more place there you have no more right there in Jesus name there's somebody that's dealing with an infirmity in your bodies right now in the name of Jesus that power that spirit is being broken in your life right now God is healing your body right now. He's healing your hip, whoever that is right now. He's healing your hip right now in Jesus' name. Somebody I see laying their hands on their knee and God is healing their knee right now in Jesus' name. So just receive the healing power of God as it's flowing into your life and into your body right now. In the name of Jesus. And so we declare you are healed. Well, by his stripes you were healed. And so we thank you, Father. For your power that is filling our lives, the Lordship of Jesus that is on demonstration in our bodies, over our minds, and we bless your name, and we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, woo, all righty, ladies and gents, um, it's offering time. Well, I know you guys have already presented your tithes and your offerings. Uh, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. And so if you're out there, hey, let's hear, some, let's hear some excitement, some exuberance, because you know that God is blessing your life, is increasing you. In fact, you just need to thank him right now, because you, you already know what he's doing in your life. You already see that check coming with those commas in it. You already see the blessing of the Lord increase in your life right now. All right? So, the Bible tells us, and this is why we're excited about giving. <laughs> we are excited about giving because we have seen time and time again how God has tremendously blessed our lives because of our obedience. And God wants you to be blessed. Let's make no mistake about it. 
Jesus was made to be poor that we through his poverty might become rich. Okay? Why? Because we are sons and daughters of the Most High God here in the earth. Okay? So we're, we're not out to brag about prosperity and enriches. Those things are a natural part of us. It's just like somebody that's in the royal family. You don't see them, you know, bragging about their riches. It's just a, so much a part of their lives. It, it's supposed to be there. You understand? You don't see Queen Elizabeth getting up and just bragging about some new diamond ring that she's got. It, it, she was born into wealth. It's just a natural part of her life. You know, and this is the mindset that we have to have. So when you get some money, well, some people say a little money, which I don't say that, you know. <laughs> they say, I got a little money. And they talk, you know, they got a check or something. No, when you get money or blessings from the Lord, it, guess what? You're excited because of what God did for you. So I'm not saying you don't celebrate that. But it's, I am wealthy, okay, in here. And it just happens out here. Do you understand? I'm blessed of the Lord. His blessing makes me rich. Okay, so I'm not blessed when I get the blessing. I'm, well, you know, an increase. I'm, I get the increase because I'm blessed. You understand? You understand? So this is why we're excited about giving time. Because we know that when we trust God, when we obey God, guess what? He just pours out. Not this other stuff. But he pours out, okay, his blessing on us. All right? So. If you've given out there, if you haven't given, had the chance to give yet, guess what? There's the opportunity. Log into our site, or you're already logged in. <laughs> you know, just click on the tab that says donate. Find the, you know, the place of where you want your offering to go. Tithe, whatever it is, and, and do so. But trust God, okay? Trust God. See what the Lord Jesus would tell you to give. See how he would tell you to give, how he would direct you to give. Because remember, it's not your money. <laughs> it's not your money, all right? <laughs> It's his. It's his. All right? <laughs> okay? Some of you need some lordship of Jesus in your finances. All right? He is Lord over all. All right? So let's lift your hands and let's bless the Lord right now. Father, we thank you because you are good. You increase us the more and the more, even our children. Even our children. Wealth and riches are in our house. So we bless you today and we thank you that you continue to increase us the more and the more and the more and the more. We honor you today, Father, for you multiply the seed that we sow. You, you cause it, you blow on it, and it just increases. Multiplication comes. And so we speak and we declare, Father, your increase over our lives. We thank you, Father, that you watch over your word to perform it. Thank you that your blessing is on us and it makes us rich. Why? So that we can continue to teach your word, preach your word. So that men, when men and women see us, they will know that we are blessed of the Lord. When they see our bodies, they know that we are healed of the Lord and God's blessing is on us. When they see us, they know that there's not just a God in Israel, <laughs> but there's a God in us and with us. So we bless you, Father, today. We honor you. We give you the glory and the praise. We turn to you, Jesus, as our faithful high priest. We ask you to turn and worship the Father on our behalf with all of the tithes, all of the offerings that have been presented here on this day and that are even being presented right now. Thank you for the increase that you continue to pronounce over our lives, the blessing, the blessing that comes from the Lord because we make you Lord over our lives. And so we honor you today. Thank you that you rebuke the devourer for our sakes. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, that the enemy has to take his hands off of our finances. He has to remove his ugly grip from anything that he has withheld or that he has blocked or hindered from us. And in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you, Father, for the increase that is coming to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Amen, 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 amen. All right. Whoa, apostles, you have anything you need to relay? Okay. All right. Praise be to God. All right. Well, I'm going to ask, um, well, you guys are already standing. <laughs> all right. Well, you out there, if you're not standing, stand. <laughs> okay. Well, on the behalf of apostles Chastine and Ella Rock, 
Um, I am Pastor Milton, and we are Faith Christian Center World Outreach. We are so glad that you have uh, tuned in today, and I pray that what you have heard today, that, you know, it was edifying to you, that it built you up, and uh, even if you have to chew on it a little while, okay, but chew on it and allow God to fill you with himself, okay, and allow his blessing and of his lordship to be over your life and in your life. So um, have a wonderful week. Have a blessed week. Be safe out there. Pray that God's angels will continue to keep you and cover you and protect you. And the blood of Jesus will keep you and cover you and your family. And um, I want to close this by saying God loves you and that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen.